to talk about disability and inclusion from an intersectional approach. All of the photographs of people that I use in this presentation are people that I know have given permission for their photographs to be taken. Um, I say this because it's important for disabled people that we are not used um, as images without our knowledge. Okay, so as Mara mentioned, I'm an expert in disability and inclusion and have been working um, in the UK and internationally for over 15 years in inclusion topics. Um, I particularly specialise in working with um, marginalised communities in policy making. Um, I'm a senior advisor at ENIL. Um, ENIL stands for the European Network on Independent Living. ENIL is a cross-disability rights um, civil society organisation that works across all of the Council of Europe countries. Um, ENIL is a disabled people's organisation. This means that it is run and controlled by disabled people and it lobbies and um, campaigns at a European level for disabled people's rights to independent living and their human rights more broadly under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of persons with disabilities. Um, I mention it because it's free for people to join and it's free for organisations run and controlled by disabled people to join as well and below is the website and I have included a couple of photographs from our Freedom Drive which is happens every two years in Brussels or Strasbourg and it is a march of um, disabled people um, asking uh, policy makers to grant rights around uh, personal assistance and independent living. Okay, as you will have already noticed, I switch between disabled people and people with disabilities. Um, this is partly because I am British and in the UK, the preferred terminology by disability activists is disabled people. It is also the preferred terminology used by ENIL. Um, the reason I switch to people with disabilities is obviously it is the language of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Um, also, it is the preferred term in Europe, mainly because it's easy to translate the concept that the person is not the problem. Okay, um, so we're going to look at who are disabled people, what are the principles that underpin inclusion, um, how to get inclusion in practice, and um, a time for questions. So who are disabled people? Um, people often have a narrow view of who is considered to have a disability in law. When they think of disabled people, they often think of deaf people, wheelchair users, and visually impaired people. And actually, under the law internationally, disabled people are a much wider group of people um, that can't be just explained in clear categories. In the world, there are one billion disabled people by current World Health Organization estimates. It is widely acknowledged that these estimates are an underestimation. Um, in Europe, depending on who you ask, between 10 and 25% of Europe's population have um, a disability of some kind. Um, the reason this varies is because of data collection um, and who different countries define as disabled. Um, 
because I was asked to bring an intersectional approach, um, the UN have provided some very interesting data which suggests that 20% of all women have a disability, 12% um, of all men have a disability. So you are more likely to have a disability if you're a woman than if you are a man. Okay. Um, and the last point is just about data collection again. Okay. So for the purposes of this webinar, uh, the definition that I am using is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I am using it because it is the most widely understood and shared definition, and also the majority of the countries in the Eastern Partnership have signed up to the convention. So under the convention, a person with a disability includes those who have long term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairments which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So what's key about this definition is that people have impairments, but it's how society reacts to those impairments that causes barriers. Okay, principles of inclusive practice. So here I've got a light bulb and someone about to grab the light bulb. Um, so traditionally, Disabled people have been viewed under something called the medical model of disability. Under the medical model of disability, disabled people are kept separate from non-disabled people and are often seen as objects of pity or charity. In the medical model, disabled people are seen as a problem that needs to be changed or fixed. Um, most decisions about disabled people's lives under the medical model are made by experts such as doctors, teachers and relatives. The medical model is the dominant model that exists in the world at the moment, um, but it does not help um, a rights-based approach. The charity model of disability is also very common in many European countries. The charity model of disability sees disabled people as objects of pity. And in the charity model of disability, um, it's trained experts and professionals that know best and that disabled people should be expecting donations in order to live rather than earning money. Um, and I've got a picture of a charity box from the UK um, from the 1950s and an advert from the UK which says give the miracle of sight to somebody in need. Now this is quite a problematic statement if you are blind and living a good life why do you want a miracle? Um, so because both the charity model and the medical model um, place disabled people in a position where they are passive in society and they are disadvantaged, disabled people came together and developed the social model of disability because they realised that um, actually it wasn't people's impairments that caused barriers but how people reacted to those impairments. In the social model of disability there are three main categories which barriers fall into. The first is environmental and physical and I have a picture on the slide of a wheelchair user next to a sign that says everybody welcome and then there's a flight of stairs. Another example of an environmental barrier is open plan offices for somebody with a hearing impairment or for somebody on the autism spectrum because it means that they can't hear what is going on because there's too much other noise to process. Um, the second area of 
barriers is attitude. And I've got an angry faced emoji. What this means is non disabled people saying what disabled people can and can't do or um, expecting lower um, results from disabled people. The third area of barriers is organizational structures or institutional barriers. An example of this is making you fill out more paperwork because you say you have a disability. And I have a picture of someone who is almost covered up by paperwork. Um, an example that I have from my own life is I got banned from all of the um, libraries at a university when I was studying um, because I was in a wheelchair. The libraries were physically accessible and the staff were very nice, but there was a policy that said that wheelchair users weren't allowed in the building on their own, so I wasn't allowed in the library. Okay, um, I've done a slide comparing the models and I'm going to read over a couple of the um, things raised. So the first um, thing is in the medical model, um, the individual is seen as the problem. The charity model, the individual is still seen as the problem. Um, in the social model, um, the barriers created by society are the problem. In the medical model, the individual needs to change. In the charity model, the individual needs help, but society doesn't need to change. In the social model, the barriers need to be removed. In the medical model, the disabled person is the victim and the client, and they have no responsibility and are disempowered. In the charity model, disabled people are objects of pity who need to be rescued by non-disabled people. In the social model, disabled people are independent citizens who can fully participate in society and have choice and control over their own life. In the medical model, information about impairments is used to categorize people. In the charity model, information about impairments is put into the public um, domain to make people feel sorry for disabled people and to give money. And in the social model, information about access needs is given on a need-to-know basis. Okay, um, so I've explained the models that affect how society reacts to disabled people, but one of the really important things um, for those looking to build inclusion is to bear in mind the cumulative impact um, that these barriers have over somebody's lifetime. So um, an example of this is that just saying you are going to open up all jobs to disabled people will not um, undo the, the barriers to education, which mean that some disabled people have lower qualifications than non-disabled people. So when they apply for those jobs, they are not the strongest candidates. The other reason why cumulative impact matters is even if you are approaching things from a positive point of view, sometimes you may get back from disabled people a negative expectation of what you're doing, and that's not necessarily because of your actions, but a history of experience for that disabled person. So if in the majority of their life, the disabled person has experienced people not listening to their needs, they're not necessarily going to suddenly think that you are the person that's going to listen. Okay, um, so intersectionality is a concept that comes from women's studies and feminism, and it's by a black feminist academic called Kimberly Crenshaw. 
And basically, the idea that she came up with, which is widely supported by many people, is that every single person that exists in the world has multiple identities and characteristics which shape how they experience the world. So I am not just a disabled person. I am also British. I am a woman. I am relatively young. I have a university education. I am white. And all of those things combined together change how I experience the world and that means that when you're looking at doing interventions you should be thinking about how those interventions might work for people that have lots of different identities that they're contending with. Okay. Um, so I've got here some examples of why intersections matter. So I've got a cross on the... Um, on the screen and on the cross I've got disability on the left hand side, gender at the top, race in inverted commas on the right hand side and age at the bottom. And I thought I would share some statistics with you from across um, Europe to explain how intersectionality affects disabled people. So in the UK, um, disabled women earn 11% less in um, their lifetime than disabled men. So that shows that there is a difference between whether you're a man or a woman, even if you both have a disability. In um, Europe as a whole, and these stats are from um, the Fundamental Rights Agency, women with disabilities are twice as likely to experience violence compared to non-disabled women. So in this, uh, in this circumstance, what this shows is there is a difference between women's experience and disabled women's experience. Um, in the intersection between age and disability, um, disabled children are seven times more likely to experience child sexual exploitation than their non-disabled peers. There are lots of reasons for this, but it's why it's really important when we're doing research into topics um, that are sensitive, we make sure that we are reaching communities that experience multiple discrimination. And finally, in the UK, women with intellectual disabilities live for 10 years less than men with intellectual disabilities. Now, you might be wondering why this is, um, and the answer from this research was that women with intellectual disabilities experience exclusion in accessing health care around women's health, and that is why they have a shorter life expectancy. Okay. Um, so this is another principle that is really important to understand when you're looking at um, being inclusive in practice. Integration and inclusion are often used interchangeably, but they mean significantly different things. Integration is allowing somebody in to a situation or a school, for example, but not making any adaption. Integration expects everybody to fit into how things already work. So it is not for the system or the structure to change. It is expected that the individual will change. Now, for the vast majority of disabled people, this is not possible. Inclusion um, is an approach that understands and encourages people to be different. In an inclusive approach, people are valued, respected, and celebrated equally. Being inclusive 
means that you listen and that you are open to change and you work with who you've got and you change what you're doing depending on who is accessing what you've got. And I've got images here of two children's toys, one where somebody is trying to fit a square um, wooden peg through a round hole and another one where every different shape in the toy has a hole that fits perfectly to it. Okay. Um, because I am talking on behalf of um, ENIL and the European Network of Independent Living, I thought it would be a good opportunity to explain a principle of independent living. So here I have a cartoon of a wheelchair user sat on a desert island with a coconut tree. Now, often people assume that being independent is doing everything for yourself. Um, and therefore, somebody sat on a desert island might be the epitome of independence. However, um, we would argue that if that person hasn't chosen to sit on the desert island, that that is not independence because independence is having choice and control about the decisions you make in life. Okay, so I'm now going to move on to law and policy, which supports inclusion. Um, and so here I've got um, a wheelchair user at a disability rights protest in the UK and they're wearing a placard saying rights not charity. I also have a disabled person giving evidence to the United Nations um, on the CRPD um, and I'm going to give you three examples of legal structures which support disability rights and inclusion. The first is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Um, this is a convention which has been widely adopted across the world. It lays out a series of rights that um, disabled people have. One of the key things about this convention um, is that the um, in the design, the intention is that none of the rights are new rights, but they are rights that traditionally disabled people have been denied. One of the other things that's really important about the UN Convention is that it's the first convention where the community affected by the convention were involved in drafting what was covered under the rights. In the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons to Disability, there are rights covering things such as education, um, legal capacity, independent living, employment, adequate standard of income and um, a variety of other rights as well. One of the really important principles of this convention, which separates it again from other human rights conventions, is the concept of progressive realisation. What this means um, for the convention is that countries do not have to have achieved um, the rights in the convention in order to sign the convention and to be ratified to make it law. Um, however, countries are expected not to go backwards in their rights around disabled people once they have signed the convention. The second area of law that I am sharing is the Equality Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the Equality Act is in the UK and the Americans with Disability Act is in the USA. These are national laws um, which give protection to people with disabilities and make um, disability discrimination illegal at a national level so that disabled people can take cases to guarantee their rights and access. 
The third legal example I was going to give you is building regulations. Now, you might think this is a bit strange, but actually building regulations are a very good way of embedding accessibility standards and increasing things like independent living, but also just making disabled people's lives easier and allowing them to be more part of the community because they can get into the buildings that that meet the regulations. Okay. Um, In terms of um, participating in decision-making and designing um, both policy and practice, Um, there are two main approaches. And here I have a picture of a group of young people um, who are sat in front of a wall where it is where there's lots of bits of paper with lots of different things written down with these young people, some of whom were disabled young people, I um, helped facilitate a co-design process. And a co-design process uses design thinking in order to explore um, challenges or barriers that a group is experiencing and helps them carry out research to be able to suggest solutions. In co-design, it is a a marginalised group working um, together to um, explore an issue. Co-production, which is more common in the disability space, both in the UK and in Europe, is where you bring together all of the decision makers affected by an issue. So, for example, if you were looking at um, healthcare, you would bring in patients, you would bring in doctors, you would bring in hospital managers, you would bring in um, relatives of patients, uh, you would bring in nurses, and together all of the people affected by an issue um, will come together and design a service that works for everyone. Both of these methods are widely used and one of the things that is good about both methods is that the outcomes from the methods tend to be more effective because they directly involve the people that are affected by um, a challenge or a barrier. Okay, Um, I have brought an example um, from the region, um, which is an example from the British Council. A number of years ago, they did a project called the Ideas Project, working with civil society and government in Georgia, Armenia, Ukraine, um, Jordan and Lebanon. And they worked with Um, those stakeholders to develop action plans for disabled people's participation in society. Now, um, because of limitations with the platform, I'm going to suggest that this is watched after um, today's webinar and we will share the link um, with you so that you can watch um, the video that accompanies this, which is a good practice example from the Ukraine. Uh, Oh, okay. Um, So we're now going to move on to practice. So once you've got the policies that you need in place, how do you make them a reality? And here, um, just as an example, I've got a picture of myself and I'm on a, um, a platform lift going up a flight of stairs. This is actually the accessible route for wheelchair users up to the Parthenon. So despite the fact that the Parthenon in Greece is thousands of years old, the Greek government have managed to make it wheelchair accessible by building in lifts in quite challenging environments, but I thought it was a good example of good practice. Okay, so 
things that you can do to support inclusion. One is disability equality training. Um, this is um, training that is run by disabled people exploring disability and inclusion issues. In London, um, Disabled people's organisations have used disability equality training with transport providers to increase accessibility on London's transport networks and it's worked very, very well. Another thing which can support inclusive practice is having access groups and these are groups in municipalities or local regions that come together of disabled people and they advise on disability access for community planning and the planning of buildings so municipalities might say we have somebody that has asked to build this building um, should we approve this plan and the disabled people will look over it and may say do you really need to have stairs in this place or is there going to be a lift put into this building um, and that is a way of thinking about access in the planning process rather than having to build in access afterwards. Um, by and large, access that is put in after something has been built will cost more money than building something accessibly in the first place. Okay. Um, another tool that is helpful in um, achieving inclusion is something called strategic litigation and strategic litigation is taking um, legal cases which will set precedents on a topic so by taking a case it will answer a question for a lot of other people that are affected by the same issue it is helpful because it means that one case can support a much bigger um, amount of advocacy and it can lead to um, changes being made without legal cases needing to be taken because people know what the outcome might be. Um, Enil has supported a number of strategic litigation cases that have been heard in the European Court of Human Rights, particularly around independent living and inclusive education. And what's useful about strategic litigation internationally is if you can set a precedent from one country that affects multiple countries, it can um, push forwards rights agendas on a number of different topics. Okay, um, and that is the end of my presentation.